Hi, better. <laughs> Hi, buddy. <laughs> Let's get to see you all together. We're gonna have some silliness today, thankfully. I don't know why. Oh, Hi, Debbie. Morning, Debbie. Hey. Hi. Welcome back. Hey. Morning, John. I have to tell you something about. I was doing something in the garden. You were doing something out in the garden? So is he a magic word? 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 John Moyer, I still have a phone call. It's good to see okay. you. All right. All right. He's being the treat monitor today for the dogs. All right. Well, we're going to go into sharing a screen because it's uh, it's nine o'clock. Um, and somebody has a radio on, so I'm going to ask you to, uh, if you have a, a radio or something going on behind you, unless that's me, I'm listening. <laughs> uh, if you could please mute yourself. We have a couple pictures from from inside the church. We tried uh, to get the camera talking with the computer and it just did not want to do that. So uh, we still have a few more steps until we can um, stream virtually from the, from the sanctuary. Uh, the building does remain closed. Uh, and probably will be another week or two. So please, uh, please stay patient. Green doesn't quite mean green yet. But the, uh, the council is meeting in two weeks and the um, task force is meeting this coming week. Uh, please a uh, reminder that Cindy's on vacation this week. So um, please help her be quiet and have some rest and relaxation. She is so far. Good. Well, and think about water. Greg thankfully has a beautiful backdrop for us today. Uh, the focus, as Jesus teaches in the Gospel of Matthew, is welcoming with a cup of cold water. Now, the ocean's probably a, a really big cup of cold water. Um, Beth also has put a, a beautiful anthem together. Uh, so today we're going to wade into this worship service and just immerse ourselves in the, the grace and gift of baptism. Today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, and it's wonderful to be gathered together for worship today. So our first hymn is Rock of Ages. And the words are on here. Oh, we can see on the screen. Can you see? Rock of Ages. Shall go 
The Antrim Mennonite Choir is providing two of our hymns uh, today, so we're thankful. And Sandy Smith actually has chosen our music, so welcome back to that part, Sandy. We're trying to get her on the keyboard in the sanctuary, but uh, didn't quite get all those pieces together yet. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And this is our Paschal candle from the sanctuary, and the candle is lit symbolizing the Christ among us, the Father and the Holy Spirit gathering us all together. We journey and talk together through the unknown of stay-at-home orders and invisible COVID-19, in addition to the realities of racism and storms, leaving power outages, plus our regular life cares and challenges. A little more than usual, we are reminded that the Lord provides us with truth tellers, accountability advocates, and little ones to guide us to walk alongside of us and to teach us all in the divine name. And sometimes the sent ones are us. Let us join in confession. Save us, O oh God, from ourselves, from racism often cloaked in pious words, from the machinations of white supremacy hidden in calls for civility from microaggressions thinly veiled in arrogance, from apologies when they don't give way to action, from forgiveness without facing the truth, from reconciliation without reparation. Deliver us, O oh God, from expecting siblings of color to continue to bear this emotional work, which is ours to do together. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage in the facing of these days. By the power of the Spirit, all for the sake of the kingdom that we share in Christ Jesus. Amen. And a word of forgiveness and absolution from Romans 5. For while we were still weak, while we were sinners, Christ died for us, forgiving us all our sin, blessing us, sending us, and setting us free so that we might bring healing and freedom in his holy name. To that, together we say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And and with you. With you. Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 For those of you who have uh, computers or would like to pass along prayers and worship throughout the week, uh, there is a blog.elca.org uh, worship, which is where we get our prayers. Um, but it has meditations and it is on uh, every week while we're in COVID. So please make note of that if you'd like some worship at home at another time. Our mini message is from Matthew today. And um, I think the I'm going to unmute people for a moment. Oh, some of you are unmuted. That's wonderful. Uh, can you guess what the theme is today? Water. Thank you. It is water. Exactly. Tammy, you said you were tired, but you're right on it. Yeah, I, re I was listening to the service last night. Sorry. <laughs> so you know all the answers. <laughs> no, I'm not going to answer everything. Not today. <laughs> mm -mm. So the, the question is, what do we use water for? And so I'm going to switch so I can see people's faces because it's kind of hard to guess otherwise. Hello, there's some other people that have been able to come on since we began. Nice to see you. Um, so can you think of anything uh, that you use water for? Can you just shout out if you've used water anytime in the last week? Shower. Shower. Wash the dishes. 
Wash the dishes. Get a drink. Get a drink. Cool down. Get a drink. Susie and Adam, if you're saying something, you're muted, so I can't quite hear you. So shower, drink. Water the flowers. Water the flowers. I'm sure they've appreciated that a lot. Mm -hmm. Cool down. To cool down. How do you cool down with water, Ethan? We said drink. Cold. Drink. Go to a pool with cold and more. There you go. You go to a pool. Have you ever found water to be uncomfortable? They want it hot. When it's too hot. Now, those of you that have animals, have you ever used a squirt bottle on the animals? <laughs> yeah. They don't like it. Hi, don't like oh, it. we got a super hiker. Now, All right, that's it. Give me my phone. Give me my phone. Oh, you can play games. Well, the games are done. Okay, I think we're going to play games together. And this was part of the joy is that water sometimes... <laughs> Like with the animals, can make us stop doing things. We'll listen to the church. And water sometimes can cool us off. He's going back to pop up. Okay. And water is like that uh, in the scriptures as well. Uh, sometimes people are fed with water. Sometimes people are stopped with water. And for us, as Christians, we start with the water right there in the baptism. We wade in and immerse ourselves. And in the anthem that you're going to hear later today, it reminds us that we not only have laborers in the field to getting all hot and toasty, uh, but also that we're swimmers, that we wade into the water all the way and, uh, and jump in to this gift of grace that God has given us. So may this week, whenever you use water, and I have mine right here behind me on a very nice coaster. Cheers to you. Every time you touch water, may you remember the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. Good news is, it's easy to share that grace. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for refreshing us with water. Thank you for feeding us with the, the water used on plants and crops. We thank you for the beauty that water brings, for the refreshment that it brings. We pray for all those that are on vacation, enjoying some splashes. And Lord, also water is a bit of a rebuke. So uh, in those moments of surprise and shock, uh, please guide us according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember that God loves you and puts you first, and we put God first in life too. I thought that sprinkler kind of looked like fun. So there's a picture of uh, kids playing in a sprinkler, which when I put this together, it was a very warm afternoon. It looked tantalizing. Here's a little picture again from the, the sanctuary. We have a picture of the lectern, and I'm sorry, as Susie pointed out, it still has the purple pyramids uh, because we are still uh, decked out for a Lent. It's been that long since we've been together inside, uh, but a little taste of the inside that's waiting for us. The good news is that God's word goes everywhere. And a little heads up before, uh, before Kathy, who's our lector, does the reading today. And that is on the first part of our reading from Jeremiah, it's very confusing because Jeremiah is being sarcastic. And so he's kind of grumpy. And what he says is opposite of what's going on, which is hard to know when we just drop in and read a couple verses. So please be mindful of that as, uh, as Kathy reads our lessons for us today. First reading is from Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 
the psalm is selections from 89. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You say, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your countenance. We exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness, for you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, your horn, our horn is exalted, for our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Kathy, if you'll wait one moment before the uh, the next lesson, I'm going to mute everybody again. I'm getting some feedback on you, and I really appreciate what you're reading. So thank you. Oh, I think I goofed up and muted you also. Are you able to okay, unmute? Okay, I'm me? back. Oh, thank goodness. I'm so relieved. Thank you. All right, and the other reading is from Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves in sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity. So now, present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage do you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much for, for reading those really full uh, scripture passages today, Kathy. Um, there's a prayer before the gospel. Those of you that cannot see the screen, uh, please join us in prayer also. God of all power and love, we give thanks for your unfailing presence and the hope you provide in times of uncertainty and loss. Send your Holy Spirit to enkindle us in your holy fire. Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world, a people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, share life, Heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest, and grow in the spirit. Wherever and however we gather, unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission that we and the whole creation might be restored and renewed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel is according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet 
will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And for the sermon, I have a picture of a splash of water, but the droplet that rises above the water is in the shape of a heart, which I thought was a, a beautiful picture that kind of gets at the essence of Christ's teaching, dying and living for us, whoever gives even a cup of cold water. Uh, and the question is, when is truth welcome or a splash in the face? I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. And I have a story to share. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing because it's about a time that, that I did not do a particularly good job at welcome. Um, it was vacation Bible school time, which is right about now. And that year, the theme was the Hope World Tour. And Hope stood for, it's an acronym, Hear Our Prayer Everywhere. So it was the Hear Our Prayer Everywhere World Tour. It was a week of prayer from different parts of God's family all around the world. And the final day, I was so excited, was an extra special celebration because the theme that week and that day had focused on Namibia. And there was a family who was moving from Namibia. The parents were going to be students at the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia that coming year, where I also was a student. Arvid and Magdalena had been to the U.S. before, but their three young children were arriving in the U.S. for the first time that week. And so they were going to be our guests of honor at Vacation Bible School. So I was a seminary student, didn't have a lot of money, but I knew what kids like to eat, pizza. So we had pizza and we had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and we had soda, and we had cake with nice, thick icing on it, and we had a couple raw vegetables, so I didn't feel too guilty about all that schleck that we were serving. We were ready for that grand finale on that Friday. We invited all the kids and their families, and this family came in for the first time, and this was supposed to be like a welcoming cup of cold water for a hot and thirsty family who had just traveled almost halfway around the world. You can probably guess what happened. The older children hid their disappointment and disgust at the foreign flavors of pepperoni and peanut butter and that sickening sweet icing and soda, but not the littlest one. He might have been three or four years old at the time. And that first bite of pizza he took, I was waiting to see a big old smile, and he made this look of disgust, kind of like that. I didn't speak the same language he did, but I understood what he meant. So he didn't like pizza. So he took a bite of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Guess what? Yeah. Yeah. Same look, exactly. And then he had a swig of the soda. Well, that he spit right out. That was just way too sweet. We tried one more. He took a bite of the cake. Same face. It was a disaster. The poor guy was hungry. He was tired. He was in a foreign place. Everyone was speaking a different language. It was strange. He was in tears. His parents took me aside and explained the truth. Their children hadn't, have, hadn't eaten processed food or food with extra sugars. They asked for the raw vegetables, which frankly, most of the other kids had ignored, so there were plenty. And we made do with that welcoming feast, kind of in shambles. I learned from that experience and would like to say that I've never repeated it again. But the reality is, the truth is that I have, because I had not prepared. I didn't know who I was welcoming. You know, a righteous person who I was welcoming, the mom, Magdalena, I didn't know that she was coming to seminary to earn her doctorate degree, and that she had already been ordained as the first female Lutheran pastor in the entire country of Namibia. I never welcomed her to share her experience standing up for women's rights. I never welcomed her to share the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that she did so well that would eventually lead her to write a manual 
for evangelism. I didn't know how to welcome her that way. And I remember her as this weekend, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of women being ordained in the Lutheran church. The little ones. I had not taken the time to learn the truth about the relationship between their culture and ours. I had briefly glanced at recipes for their food, and thankfully I had looked up some children's games, which went over much better than the meal. I had not learned their language, but I had learned from these little ones that a hug and laughter translates very well. And a prophet. Their dad, Arvid, said to me later that semester, probably a month or two later, when I had declined yet another offer to eat together at their place. He said, you know, Americans all have watches, but they never have time. I did not like hearing that truth. I had a watch, but I never had time to sit down, to be with them, to sit with them, to eat with them, to listen with them, to talk with them. It was truth that I needed to hear and truth that I still need to hear. And that truth provokes me still to change my ways. You know, it's easier to welcome what we want to hear. It's easier to welcome similar tastes and similar lifestyles. It's easier to, to welcome praises and promises. It's easier to proclaim what's easy to hear and being welcomed. Maybe that's why Jeremiah was so sarcastic when speaking to the false prophet Hananiah. Hananiah told people what they wanted to hear. What did they want to hear? They wanted to hear praises. Hey, you're doing great. So Hananiah said, hey, you're doing great. They wanted to hear praise and promises. So Hananiah gave them promises. No, Babylon's not going to destroy you, even though they've been fighting against you for over 25 years by that point. He told them what they wanted to hear. And you know, was any of it true? No. Not at all. Nope. Hananiah said what people wanted to hear, but it wasn't true. He was this false prophet because he was pretending that God was telling him all that good praise and promise. Now the people had strayed from worshiping God and were focused on sacrificing to idols. And consequently, the Babylonians were going to prevail in the next war, sending waves of God's children into slavery and servitude in a foreign land, as some had already been taken away. This was the last king. This was the end of their kingdom. They were only a couple years away. And the exile would not last forever, but it would forever be a traumatic event with destroyed cities, leaving families grieving, lives disrupted, and a scar from a wound that would not be forgotten. That's the news that Jeremiah was preaching. And of course, most people did not welcome Jeremiah over for a meal. Most people did not want to hear what Jeremiah had to say. Most people did not welcome that kind of news. You know, the truth that hurts, the truth that sheds light on wrongs, the truth that would not be forgotten, the truth that pointedly says, you know, you have a watch and a lot of money and comfort and stuff, but you are parched. You don't have the time. You're parched with poverty when it comes to counting spiritual riches and committed mutually trusting relationships with God. Jeremiah pointed out, your king Zedekiah is a puppet, and you've forgotten what it means to follow your God living in the covenant. They should have known. You know, their cousins up in the northern kingdom were destroyed by the Assyrians only 130 years before, and it was coming their way next. So what does that teach us about welcome? Well, Jesus says to welcome the prophet. That means welcoming the truth. Even if it's like Jeremiah and it's truth we don't want to hear, or truth that's hard to hear, or truth that's uncomfortable. Welcome the truth tellers. Jesus says to welcome the righteous ones. I would call them the accountability advocates. The people like Magdalena that are full of good news and insights in different ways. But sometimes we don't welcome folks like that. It's a little too different. And welcome the little ones, the people who are seen not only as young, but the little ones are sometimes interpreted as people that are treated as less than, less than important, less than essential, less than someone we need to take time with. 
So I wonder, how do we welcome? Do we welcome people who don't know Jesus yet? Do we welcome people that are energetic and eager to be part of social justice, but not so eager to be part of worship? Do we welcome those that are prophetic? You know, there was someone in the congregation a couple weeks ago that had a suggestion that I really appreciated. The suggestion was that we craft a statement of welcome, not simply declaring that we're friendly and welcoming congregation as so many congregations do and are, but intentionally spelling out who is welcome and then doing the research that I did not do before welcoming a family from Namibia, from their Lutheran church to our Lutheran church. Do we welcome 12-step groups? Do we welcome people who identify as LGBTQIA? Do we know that this means lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgendered and queer or questioning or intersexual or asexual or allied? And how will we welcome people who ask uncomfortable questions? How are we gonna do it? We're gonna wade in the water. We're gonna step right in and as Beth St. Angelo uh, and I were talking this morning, she said, this is not just dipping a toe in the water of our baptism. This is walking all the way in. And sometimes water is uncomfortable, but sometimes it's refreshing. And I would pray that as we listen to all the teachings of Jesus, as we recognize the disciples all around us, as we receive welcome from others, and as we receive the truth from prophets, and as we receive the guidance from the righteous, and as we receive the teachings from the little ones, May we recognize all the ways that this water of our baptism, this calling of our baptism is a gift. I can think of a couple ways just right now in our congregation. A cup of cold water is a phone call. A cup of cold water is a little gift left on the porch. A cup of cold water is shared through a meal or sitting around a table for Zoom for worship. A cup of cold water is an ear saver for your mask, lovingly made with rainbow loom rubber bands. A cup of cold water is a prayer shawl embrace for a family grieving. A cup of cold water is learning to speak a social media language. A cup of cold water is a menu of food from a different culture communicating welcome. A cup of cold water is laughter and games led by the youngest among us. And a cup of cold water is welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus welcomes all of us, calls all of us, and gathers us in. So even though we might be unlovable like Jeremiah, or we might be from a different place or a different time, we are all called together as people who are baptized, brothers and sisters, to refresh one another, to guide one another, and sometimes to douse one another in that grace and good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we are awash with your grace. Please continue to bring that cool water to our parched souls. Please continue to be with us as we share your welcome with all those around us, whether virtually or in person. Please continue to guide us and keep us in our baptismal promises, surrounded by your love, your spirit, your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. And the hymn is Abide With Me. This, if you have a hymnal, is 629 in the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Hymnal, sung by the Antrim Mennonite Choir again. Oh, my. 
guide thyself. Let guidance take and be. Through cloud and sunshine, oh, abide with me. Message from Hebrews says, For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Please join me as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. All are welcome to gather together. We have a picture of the altar, which is still standing, and I was behind it at the time, so you get to see me twice, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, at this point. Uh, we offer our gifts, and our gifts are thanksgiving to God. We are thankful in the midst of fear and struggle that Christ brings us through as witnesses of grace. We saw that in some of the messages that y'all have posted for one another in the announcements. And God gives us diverse languages, ethnicity, cultures, and backgrounds. We are unified, not uniform. And God heals us. We've heard so many experiences of people uh, receiving healing, especially in these last three months. And the anthem played by Beth and sung by Beth is step into the water. Your signal's wearing now, Pastor. Yes. Yeah, I think my husband just got on to start their worship service. So hopefully this will work. Thanks, Tammy. You just sound like a robot. Good job, Beth. I agree. Thank you so much, Beth. Think of that every time you step into the water. And welcome to all those. Uh, evidently, we're having some internet issues uh, with myself and with some others. So welcome to those of you coming in and out today. 
right now we are gathering uh, for the prayers of the church. Even though we're distant from each other, we are called to join together to pray for our needy world. Each petition is going to conclude, hear us, O God, our light and our shield. And I'll ask you to join me in the response, your mercy is great. Your mercy us... is great. Thank you. Your Let us pray for the church of Jesus Christ around the world. <clears throat> Let us pray for our own congregation and for its leadership. We ask, Lord, especially that you'll be with the folks on the Reconnect Task Force and the Council. We pray for the health of the earth, its lands, its seas, its animals. Your Hear us, great. O God, our light and our shield. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Your mercy is great. We pray for those who work in the fields and produce our food. We pray for peace between and within nations. We pray for our president and executive branch, the Congress and Supreme Court, as we approach the anniversary of our country's independence. Hear us, O God, our light and our shield. Let us pray for those who are oppressed or enslaved or poverty stricken. Let us pray for an end to sexism, ageism, classism, and racism. Let us pray for a just way forward for both protesters and police. Hear us, O God, our light and our shield. We pray for all who are sick or sorrowing, those who are in hospitals or institutionalized. Especially today, we pray for Elizabeth, for Chuck, for Claire. We pray for all who have COVID-19 and their families. We pray for their healing, especially for Mick, Chloe and her family, Rob, Hear us, O God, our light and our shield. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who are isolated by distance, illness, work, unemployment, or other restrictions. We pray for those who are homebound, for Betty and Lester, for Richard, Michael, and Sharon, for Pearl, Leon, Betty, William, and Grace. We pray for those struggling with unemployment or underemployment or temporary layoffs, including Bonnie, Darlene, Sandy, and 900 co-workers from Reading Hospital. Hear us, O God, our light and our shield. Your mercy is great. We pray for the military, including Lily and Dominic especially as Dominic prepares for deployment this week. We pray for medical workers, for AJ and Tammy, for researchers. We pray for families facing an unprecedented summertime. And we thank God for the apostles Peter, Paul, and Thomas, for all those who have died in the faith, Today, we lift up those who have died and been welcomed into the kingdom by you, Christ. We pray for Paul, for Joyce, for Shirley, for Harry, for Donald, for Bob, for Jaden, for Brennan, for Arlene, for Betty, for Rich, for Donald, for Kathy and Mark's mother, for Mary Jane. And Lord God, we pray for all who grieve, all who mourn and miss these and other loved ones. And we ask that you would give us an opportunity to embrace each of these with compassion, with care, and with condolence. Let us pray that at our end, we will join these saints in God's presence. Hear us, O God, our light and our shield. Your mercy is great. 
receive our thanks, our joys and celebrations that we continue to be a family of faith while we are spread apart. Lord God, we thank you that Tina and Josh have become married. We pray for the, with joy and anticipation for the upcoming marriages of Tanya and Matt, for Anna's granddaughter, and now as we learn, uh, for Nick and Adrian as they join their family together with Skylar. We pray in thanksgiving for the graduation of Diana. We thank you for the upcoming birth that Christine is looking forward to and for the healing of Catherine and Joan. Lord, we ask that you'll be in that sometimes painful process of ongoing healing from racism, from surgeries, from injustice, from emotional, spiritual, and physical wounds. We pray that you'll be with those preparing for surgery. Hear us, O oh God, our light and our shield. Your, Your mercy is great. great. Receive our prayer, Holy One. O oh God, you are yourself a cup of cold water that we crave, relieving our deep thirst. Receive these prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ. For your mercy is great now and forever. Amen. 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 Let's join together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Amen. who art in heaven, Amen. hallowed be thy name. Amen. Thy kingdom come, kingdom come, thy will be done, will be done. on earth as it, is in heaven. as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our, this day our daily bread. bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our hymn is Blessed Assurance, because that's our prayers do bring that blessed assurance. It's hymn uh, 638. If you have your evangelical Lutheran worship hymnal. Yeah. I can. And if you don't, the words are on the screen. If you can see that, if not, please uh, join along in the chorus. This is sung by the That part is done, but there's more, Adam. <laughs> Just a little bit. Nah. And that's this. 
It's good well, news as we're sent out, almost like a cup of clean water. May God, the source of glory, God, the word of life, God, the spirit of truth, bless you all now and forever. Amen. 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 Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And to that we say, thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And I have a little picture of the exit, too, over at church. So God welcomes us into the week. This is just the beginning of wading into the waters of our baptism. So thank you for gathering for worship. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so we can see one another and join together in fellowship. What? Now you can talk to the people. Mm. Uh, <laughs> this is a Lego cow. I like your Lego cow. What flavor milk does a Lego cow give? <coughs> Lego milk. <laughs> Lego milk. <laughs> you know that there are three different types of milk. Regular milk, strawberry milk, and chocolate milk. Those are the three types. There's no different more milks. Just only three kinds of milks. Magic! Yeah, magic left. <laughs> Betsy Fair, is that the kind of milk that your cats like to drink? <laughs> I like strawberry. Chocolate <laughs> strawberry. Yeah. Right. I'm going to mute you just for a minute uh, to let you know that um, Jackie and Judy, who are Paul Schwambach's children, uh, have invited people, if you are comfortable and if uh, it is not going to hurt your immunity, uh, the service for Paul is tomorrow. It is Monday. Uh, two o'clock is the viewing, three o'clock is the service at Lutz Funeral Home over on Perky Oman Avenue, and the burial is going to follow at Charles Evans. So it is a public service with masks, of course, and social distancing, uh, but for those that uh, can and would like to participate, they wanted to, to let you know that, and thank you so much uh, for all the, the calls and cards and condolence and support um, that you've given to the family. And uh, Mary Lou's friend, Mary Jean, uh, also passed away this week, so we extend condolences to you, even as we celebrate uh, some of the joys of life that are coming. Uh, Beth and Brian <coughs> announced there's a wedding coming up in their household. Um, so I think we get to, to talk with one another. There is an adult Bible study today, um, probably in a, in a couple minutes. Please do note that with July 4, we are not doing the, the Fun Friday this Friday because of the holiday. We do have a study on Wednesday though, and we'll continue to do that. And there's a meeting tomorrow for folks that would like to be part of God's work, Our Hands with Freedens Oli. Uh, that will be a Zoom meeting. So if you're interested, please send me an email so I can pass the link out once I get that. What time is that? Uh, one o'clock is that, and the funeral's at two. So it will conflict uh, for folks that are participating in the, the viewing. Okay. Uh, and there's a task force meeting, a reconnect task force is meeting on the second as you're able to, and that went out in email. So I'm going to stop talking. And if anybody else uh, has anything they'd like to share, please do. Uh, if you're going to need to unmute yourself as you go through to talk to each other. Hey, Pastor. Oh, and I think Sandy Smith said she's going to go. So. Hi, Sandy. Are there are people waving to you that are not unmuted, Sandy. But thank you for picking our hymns, Sandy. It's wonderful to, to have your, your presence that way in worship again. So have a good afternoon. You too. <laughs> and Anna Eckenroth, did you manage to get through all that rhubarb? Oh, oh you're yeah. you're muted, Anna. I don't know if you can yeah. hear me, but I want to let you know my step granddaughter Samantha. She did get married now in a little almost door. They couldn't have a lot of people. She did get married. Oh, good. Congratulations. What, what is Samantha's spouse's name? She had to play out, but at least now they're married. And what's her spouse's name, Anna? 
Samantha. And who, who is she married to? <laughs> Call him Nate, but his name is Nathan. Nathan. And they were married on June the 20th. Okay. Congratulations to them. I know a lot of weddings have uh, taken different formats. Yeah. Okay. We were muted. We were muted. Okay, was somebody muted that wanted to say something? We just wanted to say hello to everybody. It's good to see you all. Hello, everyone. How's it going, Craig? Going fine. Good. Going fine. All happy and healthy. Thank goodness. Right. Nope. goodness. So far, so good. I accidentally deleted it. Um, first of all, you all remember you all remember John the Baptist, of course. And one of the things what I wanted to show you was I knew he was in prison. You all knew he was in prison. He was beheaded there. Very important uh, story in the Bible. But it never occurred to me what um, what this might have meant that he was in prison. But the um, the the author tells us that he was at a location called Machiris, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and this is a for a combination of fortress and palace um, in the area. And I'm going to try to show you a picture of it. I hope it'll. Oh dear, now what did I do? Okay, I got it. <laughs> I got it. So I'm going to hold it up to the the camera, and hopefully it'll. Where is the camera, by the way? Is it going to be? Okay. Can you see that at all? We see a reflection. A reflection of a screen, yeah. I think. That's what I was afraid of. Um, Their window. Tell you what, I can try and look it up if you want, Susie. I don't know how it's spelled though. M A C H A E R U S. Okay. Prison. Uh, just yeah. write that, and then it because it's a it's a castle actually. Okay. Did I spell it? Make sure I spelled it right for yep. you. I'm sure I, I got it. It's just taking me a minute to. And and the one I was trying to show is where it looks like a gigantic mound. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Now I lost my Zoom thing, but okay. And sorry, you might be singing. You might be hearing the uh, the hymns from Hope Lutheran in the background. So now the one I was hoping to show is 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 the like the third one, the third one down all the way on the left. That one. Okay. You can see the um, the sea in the <laughs> background there. <laughs> I don't know how big that is for you. But. Um, yeah, you can you can probably see that, but you can you see little tiny little tiny um, kind of bumps on the top of the that mound. Yeah. Those are pillars. Those are pillars of the castle. The castle sat on top of that. That is that is huge, and and somewhere in there is where John the Baptist was in prison. And so I thought that was pretty. I thought that was pretty fascinating to see. It didn't occur to me. Yes, thank you, Pastor. We're around there. That's where the castle was, and there uh -oh. are still some of the pillars are are still in existence. So you can see some of the remnants of it. But um, it was it was a, a massive place. It was a very important fortress uh, for that area for Herod Antipas. You're familiar with that name. Mm -hmm. And uh, that he was, that's where uh, John the Baptist was, uh, was in prison. Oh. And you can see it's not a very friendly terrain either. It's out in the middle of the desert. And um, earlier in the chapter of Matthew, we're going to be, our uh, scripture today is in Matthew 11, verses 7 through 19. And earlier in the chapter, John 
uh, sent ma messengers, some of his disciples from the prison that he, ha he had been talking to them, and he sent them to Jesus to, to answer a question. Does anybody remember what the question is? Anybody remember from their, from their Bible? From are, you, their, are you the one we're you supposed the Christ? to follow? Yes, that's right. Yes. Are you the one we're waiting for? And, um, and are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another is what he asked. And Jesus sends them back and he doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no. He doesn't really give them firm affirmation of it. But what he says is that, that um, they're supposed to report to John what they have heard and seen. And um, what they have heard and seen has been some of the things that Jesus has been doing around the around the land and what what are some of those things anybody remember what are some of the things that jesus was doing that um could have been an indication that he is the one to come i think an answer is coming from the hefner household and what was that hefner's healing healing absolutely he made the blind see he made the lame walk he cleansed the lepers the deaf were hearing, able to hear. Even more than healing, what did he do? He's preaching and teaching. Preaching and teaching. That. I, so he, he was doing what, um, you know, these are the things he was doing. And it's interesting, he, he did not report to John that uh, he was exactly what the Messiah was that they were expecting, because what is the Messiah they were expecting? What did they think the Messiah, what did the Israelite, Israel, the Jewish people, what did the Jewish people think that, that, um, that the Messiah was going to be like? More like a warrior. Yes, a warrior, a hero, you know, coming in on a horseback, you know, taking the, take, making the battles fall in their direction, that kind of thing. And so he, that's not at all what he said he was doing, but he told the, uh, the John's disciples to take back to John what you see and you, what you hear. And those are the kinds of things they saw and heard. So in, in starting in our scripture today, starting with uh, verse seven, uh, John's disciples have, have returned to John. They have gone back to report to him. And um, it's, it's, let me see, somebody, does somebody have their Bible ready that they could read verses set 10, seven through 10 for me? Wendy's raising her hand. Oh, great, Wendy, go ahead. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal places. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, so now John was asking who, who uh, Jesus is, and now Jesus turns around and looks at the crowd, and he says to the crowd, you know, who do they think John is? You know, now that John's disciples have gone, um, he's asking them about John. And he's asking them what they went into the wilderness to look at. And some of the things he mentioned, of course, are the reed shaken by the wind. And uh, what do you think that, do you think he's actually talking about vegetation there? Is he actually talking about a plant? What, what do you think he might be referring to by a reed shaken by the wind? Is John shaking things up? Well, now that's a good point. Yes, he absolutely was. He absolutely was. That's one way, I, that's not the way the author interpreted it, but I think that's a, that's a very good question. The other thing is, what is a, we, a reed shaking in the wind? Is it a constant or? It depends on the wind. Yeah, well, that's true. But if the wind's pretty strong, the, wi the, wi the reed is doing, is what right. you see with the wind, it's kind of... People that are being wishy-washy and going with the popular see, moment. 
okay, maybe you read this because that's exactly the words that the author used, wishy-washy. Oh, yeah. So, no, yeah. I haven't, actually. <laughs> So we can look at it either way with the read where they, you know, and that's so true in so much of the scripture, at least that at, there are several ways to interpret different things. And in this case, the read certainly could be um, somebody stirring things up or it could be, are they coming out to look at somebody wishy-washy? Is that what they're looking for? Um, how about the other thing that they were coming out to look for? Do you remember what else went, Randy, Wendy read? Someone dressed how? In soft robes. And what do you think of when you think of somebody in, a, in soft robes? Somebody, I, do you think the people, the people that Jesus was talking to at the, in the crowd there, that their clothing was real nice and soft? Soft makes me think of gentle. Gentle, okay, yeah. And comfy. Boy, it's a soft robe. So Boy, who would be... I'm sorry? Royalty. Royalty, yes, absolutely. Where it's it's comfy and it's it's soft and, and they're the ones, and in fact, it goes on to say, who wear soft robes are in pa royal palaces. And so, yes, do, well, so did you come out to look for uh, somebody, you know, some, some royalty here? Why did you come out to the, come out to the, to the desert? Um, <clears throat> And, and um, let me see what I have here. Someone dressed in soft robes. Uh, someone who point, that would point to a ruler at the time was, was Herod Antipas. So that's who, uh, were they coming out to see maybe Herod and see what he had to say, or certainly somebody who would be in support of Herod Antipas. In fact, when, one of the interesting things here, here is, um, that I, I find this very interesting, and the author points out that Herod Antipas, who might have been the one represented by the soft robes, he minted coins. And what do you think might have been on those coins? Something else mentioned just before the royal, the, the soft robes. What else might have, been, might have been minted on those coins? Wasn't the reed on the coins? Yes, the reeds. So by, in two ways, he may very well have been re, uh, referring to Herod Antipas. He was referring to the reeds as well as the soft robes. However, you know, there are many different ways that you can look at it, of course. And, and the author suggested maybe it was sort of a, an inside joke, you know, the kind of joke that they would understand but wouldn't, wouldn't really mean too much to us without that little bit of historical information. Susie, you also have another uh, audio visual aid. There's a very soft little puppy that just uh, kissed Kathy Bagley on the cheek. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my! A, a puppy, Kathy. Kathy's muted, but they have a new member in the family. Oh, you talked about that, Kathy. This is Lady. Oh, so cute. I we can't. I can't see her. We can't. Oh, uh, is she King Charles? It is. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, how nice. I saw the puppy on Pastor's lap. Yes. Well, she just woke up, so she's with me now. Her name's Lady. Oh, oh there she is. Oh. Like lady in the tree. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, she is soft. How nice. Very good. <laughs> King Charles Spani Spaniel is the ultimate lap dog. Oh, wonderful. Just cuddle up with you and be with you. Excellent. That's what you need, Kathy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. She was helping me pick berries this morning before church. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. No, <laughs> that's a great interruption. I love it. <laughs> so uh, so do either of these do either of these pictures uh, describe John as a as a um, as a shaken reed or a, no. someone in soft robes? Not at all. Does that sound like John? Not at all. Not at all. No, not at all. He was not, so he was in the desert, but he wasn't there to live in luxury. He was there, he was there to fulfill the word and to, to preach the word. So what does, uh, let me see, what does, what does Jesus suggest that John you could you could say John was. So 
in fact, it says, it says, uh, he, he goes on, he says, what then did you go out to see? If they didn't go out to see the shake and read, if they didn't go out to see somebody in a soft robe, they didn't, they did, couldn't, if, if they were heading to see John particularly. So what were they going to see if they weren't going to see somebody wishy-washy or a royal person? What, what were the they going to see? The one crying in the wilderness. Yes. And, and how, what's one word that might describe that? A prophet. And the, and prophet, yes. They were coming out to see a prophet. And Jesus says, he's not just a prophet. He's more than a prophet. He is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Now, let me, we, can, we can look these up if you would like. Uh, he's quoting two, two scriptures, and he's not quoting them exactly. He's paraphrasing them. But the first one is from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Anybody feel comfortable enough with the books of the Bible to quick find Malachi chapter 3, verse 1? Sure. Great. Oops. One, one page. Well, good. You found it there. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple, to his temple. Okay. And how about the other one is from Exodus 23, verse 20. Somebody find that? Exodus 23, verse 20. Okay. 23 verse 20. Okay, go ahead, Mary. Um, I am going to send an angel in front of you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Okay, very good. You can see they're not by any means direct, uh, quote, this is not by any means a direct quotation, but it's because it says, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And we know we've we've heard we've heard before that an angel is a messenger, and so the Exodus verse refers to an angel that Jesus is referring to as a messenger. But in any re, in any case, he's sending a mess. Uh, the quote is about sending a messenger ahead who will prepare the way. And um, even though it's not a direct quote, what it does is the people that were listening to this the crowds where Jesus that Jesus was was uh, talking to and teaching they they knew these verses they knew these verses from the old scriptures and so it was a reference to their roots and what they knew was about to come and so they could reflect back on that very well okay um, is somebody uh, anybody how Wendy I'll be happy if you'd read again or someone else Matthew 11, verses 11 through 15. I have it, unless somebody else wants to do it. Go ahead, Wendy. What'd you say, 11 through 15? That's right. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. Okay, now our author admits that some of these verses are a little difficult, so he's you know, he, he made some, gave some ideas, and I'm going to do my best to help us through this. Pastor, I'm so glad you're here because maybe you can help too. Maybe. But one, <laughs> one of the things the author says is that John is greater than a prophet because he is at the threshold of the kingdom. Now, the kingdom, of <laughs> course, is what, what, what Jesus has us, is usher, ushering in. The kingdom of God is being ushered in the kingdom that enters the world through Jesus. And so uh, John is standing there at the, at the threshold of that. And so he's greater than any of the prophets that the people ever knew. That's easy to understand because he's got, he's got an even more important, uh, an even more important message 
and job than the previous prophets had is as important as those, their jobs were. And he goes on to say that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And it says it does not come, it, that the kingdom does not come quietly into the world. Um, and, and we can see that it did not come quietly into the world. If that were true, then everyone would have bowed to Jesus and, and it would have been so obvious to everyone what Jesus was there for and, and he should be revered, certainly not the violent uh, end to the life that he had. So who might have had a strong objection to, to uh, that kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus was ushering in? Who might have had a strong objection to that? Can you think of somebody? The Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees, absolutely. Okay. Somebody else? Probably Herod himself. Have Herod himself, absolutely. Yes, positively. And, and who was his boss? Who was Herod's boss? Oh, oh Rome. Rome. Here. Rome, but locally, we heard we heard about Herod's boss in the crucifixion story. Who was Herod's boss? Yeah. Pontius Pilate. Pilate, right. So Pilate and Herod, um, they didn't, you know, they didn't want things stirred up. And of course, John the Baptist and Jesus also certainly were there stirring things up. They didn't like to see hear about that. So. <clears throat> um, so what did Herod and Pilate in particular, not so much the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't, they, they're not uh, part of this question so much, although they certainly were involved uh, in what happened with Jesus. But what did Herod and Pilate have in particular that they used as a means of holding on to their power? The clues in the scripture that we just read. Violence? Yes, violence, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Suffering and death, those were some of their, some of their the main tools in their toolbox on how to maintain their power and to control the people. So it's very important. And the, the author suggests that verse 12, this is in the one that's particularly hard to understand. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the, and vi the violent take it by force. So this is where it's a little bit difficult, but in the, fir in the first half of the, of the verse, the, the kingdom suffered violence as it has been forcefully advanced. So um, this is the author's take on this. And the, and the, he says the Greek is a little difficult to translate here and various, um, various um, reports or translations of this same verse come out differently. And there's a different, more positive ver uh, reading of a the similar, uh, of the same scene in Luke. Can somebody find Luke verse, chapter 16, verse 16? What chapter? Luke 16, verse 16. Hmm. Somebody have it? Uh, not yet. Not I yet? Have it now. 16, 16. Oh, uh, Marianne, you want to read it? 16, 16. Okay. Chapter, Luke, chapter 16, verse 16. The law of Moses and the writings of the prophets were in effect up to the time of John the Baptist. Since then, the good news about the kingdom of God is being told and everyone forces his way in. Okay. Okay, she said the law and the prophets were in effect. It was a little hard to understand. Maybe it's just my hearing, Marianne, but I'll repeat it uh, if that's okay. The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since yeah. then, the good news of the kingdom is proclaimed and everyone tries to enter it by force. So it's a little bit more positive than suggesting that, um, as, as is in our verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. 
but it's suggesting, um, Pastor, did you want to want to uh, speak here, help, you know, jump in and help out here a little bit if you have any thoughts? I don't have any thoughts. I have myself muted because they're singing again in the other room. Oh, okay. Um, I was just, just looking it up and really um, in the Greek, I don't have any different than what you've no, said. Nothing, right? nothing more helpful. Do you no. think maybe it has to do with uh, with the law? I, maybe it's because I'm reading through the, the whole Bible right now, and I'm in Leviticus. Mm. But, you know, it's all of that violence with if you want to repent, you have to kill this, and it has to be eaten by these priests, and it has to do that. And, and you know, and maybe, too, all of the prophets, like, their out, end outcome isn't very good. No, um, right. So, but, but I'm thinking like the law is, is really violent. And after Jesus comes, you're not in the law anymore. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Well, the, he goes, he goes beyond the law. Right. Yeah. So that's a very good point. Maybe, um, I like that. Maybe we should send a comment to the author and suggest that maybe that's helpful because, uh, I, I, you're right. There was a lot of violence in the Old Testament, of course, and through the law, and and Christ brought um, a, a change from that. He he brought that the violence of the past and the violence of the law was no longer necessary. Okay, so verse uh, verse fourteen claims that did we get yes? If you are willing to accept it. He is Elijah who is, is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. So Jesus is suggesting that, that John was in fact Elijah. Now, what, do you, what could he mean by that? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about that? No clue. Reincarnation. Yeah, do you think so? <laughs> well, he didn't need to be reincarnated. Yeah. Yeah. He was taken he up and he never right. died. He 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 he, not, he was taken up live, right? Yeah. But Elijah's the one who's supposed to uh, usher in the Messiah, so that's another layer of Matthew reaching out to the people in the Jewish audience, knowing his audience. Yes, yes, yes. Now I'm going to read. I'm going to read what the author has to say, and that that was perfect, Pastor. Thank you. Verse 14 claims that John was in fact Elijah. This does not mean that Jesus or Matthew endorse theories of reincarnation, but that the promise of Elijah's return has been fulfilled in an unexpected way, as John comes with the same spirit and style of ministry as Elijah. And as John prepares the way for God's action, John apparently, I'm sorry, as, and as John, I'm sorry, prepares the way for God's action, John apparently did not think of himself in these terms, John can only be seen as Elijah if Jesus is already confessed as the coming Lord. So it's uh, you that was very true, Pastor. He's 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 almost like the reincarnation of Elijah that the people were were expecting as the the herald of the Messiah, and so they were uh, they were uh, listening that way. Okay, then we come to verse fifteen. And verse 15 says, well, I gotta get the right book here. Verse 15 says, let anyone with ears listen. And it, it's, not, it's not an invitation. The way it's written, it's not an invitation. Come and hear, come and hear. No, it's a command. It says, with anyone with ears must pay attention to this. It's very important. And, and the author tells us that the proper, proper response is not to admire John or to, to debate his identity, but to enter the kingdom as he announced. And so it's a, a reference that you hear this, you have to pay attention and, and do as, as, you, as uh, is told. So the next section is Matthew 11, verses 16 through 19. Wendy, you, you up to continuing? Nobody else wants to. Why? Go ahead. What'd you say, 16 through 19? That's correct. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, 
and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Okay, thank you very much. So we're told Jesus has harsh words here. He's not he's not being kind to the to the people in the crowd around him. And uh, so what is he saying about the people's response to John? What did they What does he say there about their response to John? They're not catching on very well. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not catching on at all. And it says here, for John came eating or drinking, and what did they say? He has a demon. I heard that from, from Jan here. So <laughs> he has a demon. Okay, so Jesus, you know, and then, then the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and what did they say about him? What, and then a drunkard. Yeah. A friend yeah. of tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, they can't be satisfied. <laughs> and and they said that in some ways they were, they you know, they're saying that John was too holy. He was serious. I mean, it's just it's too serious. It just, you know, they couldn't relate to him. But Jesus, who came with unconditional love, and he, he ate with the tax collectors, he ate with sinners, and he wasn't holy enough. And, you know, so they, you know, they're, they were not, the, the two the two extremes maybe neither of them uh satisfied the people in both cases the people were just, like they were just finding fault no matter what right right and why would that be gee don't we do that today yeah. <laughs> absolutely but why then why then would they have found fault with both of them because they were both going against the grain yeah yeah they both both of them were saying you know come on shape up <laughs> you know here we're offering you something we're offering you something but you have i mean it's not it's a free gift but you have to accept the gift you know that sort but, of thing but if it's not what you're looking for you just find fault with it that's right absolutely right they wanted they wanted the violence to be and they wanted to you know the, the the powerful ruler to free them from the tyranny of rome yes that's all they saw they didn't right. want to listen to anything else right. right anybody else have a thought i keep here i hear other it sounds like somebody else sometimes tries to speak and i gets talked over so somebody else have a thought Okay, the, uh, the way this is set up, it's designed um, for, for the people to list to, that are listening to it to recall Deuteronomy. And uh, <clears throat> the, those who, who eat and drink like gluttons and drunkards, any idea what happened to them <laughs> in Deuteronomy? I'll tell you. Passed out or put to death? Yeah, they were stoned. <laughs> if they, you know, an individual who was seen as a drunkard and a glutton was was liable to be stoned, according to Deuteronomy. Um, well, if he, if he was really drunk, he was already stoned in our world. Well, there you go. <laughs> there's a there's a point I hadn't thought of. Good for you. <laughs> I have to make a joke. Oh, I'm glad you did. Okay, so, so far, so far in this part up to now in Matthew, the criticism of Jesus has been, has been sort of verbal, you know, that the, there's a lot of arguing and there's a lot of name calling, there's a lot of uh, words coming out against him, but we all know the, the rest of the story. So for now in Matthew, it's verbal. What what does it become as, as the story goes on? It becomes violent. It's physical. Yeah. Goes back to our word about violence, yeah. It, it, 
and it begins, it, you know, it starts as a, this verbally and it ends most violently. I mean, he was beaten, he was, he was, um, and, and on a cross, there's no, not, not a more violent death than that could be. Okay, so the, there's a little um, finishing up paragraph here by the, <clears throat> by the author that I'd like to read, because this is where he brings wisdom into this. And of course, the last statement there is that wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And so he's talking to the people about, about God's wisdom. And the, the author tells us, yet yeah, true wisdom, God's wisdom, will be vindicated by her deeds. John the Baptist in prison had heard about the deeds of Jesus. Remember, we talked about that, the, the healing that he did, the raising of the dead, the teaching and the preaching, and wondered whether he really was the promised one. Jesus had responded by reminding John what he, Jesus, had been doing giving sight to the blind, healing lepers, raising the dead, and preaching good news to the poor. These are wisdom's deeds, the things God just, God's just and healing wisdom urges and brings. It is a wisdom that those who think they are wise cannot see when it is right in front of them. Okay. Can, can they hear you if you read, Jan? Okay. Because I was going to let you read word today. Which month? Yeah. Okay. The the word today is remember is a little uh, is several paragraphs that refer to our world today. It it, it brings the the word into into today. So I'll, uh, I will. This is the the author's summation and and application to today. Okay, Jesus' statement in verse 11 may startle us. He claims that anyone who listens to his words and so enters into God's kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Such a claim can seem absurd. Truly, we would be foolish and arrogant to make such a claim for ourselves. What is Jesus talking about? The greatness Jesus is pointing to is not personal achievement. Rather, he is indicating a radical change in what greatness means and how it is measured. John pointed to the kingdom, though even John had trouble recognizing God's wisdom at work in Jesus. Anyone in the crowd could be one of these greater than John, because the kingdom dawns with Jesus and his ministry. The measure of greatness has been transformed by, his, by the kingdom. It is not power, status, fame, or wealth, but being a follower of Jesus that marks true greatness and true wisdom. For us today, looking at the news, it can seem that the great ones are those who push the levers of power and influence in the world. It is too easy for us to feel exiled from those circles of power and importance. But this impression is a deceptive, is a deception. There is greatness and divine wisdom in caring for children, or in teaching, or in visiting the sick and in prison. God's wisdom uses different people with different styles and abilities to accomplish its deeds in the world. Some use their voices loudly and wild, widely to call, call for justice and peace. They speak like John the Baptist with fiery words against oppression. Others work more quietly to welcome all around them, wherever they are, into the embrace of the kingdom. We will not always agree on the best approaches, strategies, and priorities. Perhaps, perhaps that is too, too is God's wide wisdom that cannot be contained by any one of us. Jesus says that by her deeds, wisdom will be vindicated, shown to be in the right. So how is Jesus shown to be in the right? We remember from our study of Proverbs that to find wisdom means to find life. Jesus, in the end, is vindicated in all his deeds by his resurrection. And he is vindicated in the life of the church, which flows from that resurrection, as by the Spirit's working, we are able to recognize the kingdom coming among us and are enabled to be wise servants of that kingdom. Okay, now just a couple general questions from the, uh, from the course study. How do you think the gospel of Jesus influences the way we evaluate the importance or greatness of people? The gospel of Jesus, how does that influence the way we evaluate the importance 
importance or greatness of people. Maybe hopefully we're looking at the inner man instead of whatever the the outer trappings are. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what are we looking for in the inner man? Or woman. Yes. <laughs> Righteousness, love, caring, compassion, the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, the gifts of the kingdom, the things that, the things that Jesus preaches. That's that's what we look for in the inner man. It's not always easy, is it? I'm seeing Mary getting her face kissed all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think you know Jesus encourages us to to find that love. Yes. Also, even yeah. in unlikely uh, situations. Right. Right. Yeah. So important. Acceptance. Oh, go right ahead. Go ahead. Acceptance is a big thing. Um, when you know, like totally being accepted as you are because I always love the hymn just as I am because I can be a weird person but uh, I love it when people just accept me the way I am. Especially who accepts us as we are according to that, that hymn. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, why is following Jesus the way of wisdom? Do you repeat the question, Susie? Uh, my uh, internet broke up a little. Oh, okay. Why is following Jesus the way of wisdom? Mm. Well, maybe that has something to do with that vindicated by her deeds. I mean, vindicated also means to be righteous. Mm -hmm. So uh, Christ surprises us that the things that Christ draws us to uh, come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Somebody else? Okay, I like with the, the author, happily, the author often gives me answers, <laughs> not always, <laughs> but uh, he says something very similar. He says, Jesus is the very embodiment of the life God promises and intends for the world. As we remember, the wisdom that calls out to everyone and wisdom that brings true life. In Jesus, in his care for all people and his insistent call that we follow the same path, we see the surprising shape of God's kingdom. You know, when we think of the kingdom, you know, people I think are looking for, you know, they're assuming royalty and um, and and the, the kingdom that, that Jesus brought was so far different from that that it was understandably hard for the people of the time to to understand. But when they saw the deeds that Jesus that Jesus did, it made it easier for them to, you know, to accept. The kingdom, the kingdom of this Messiah was different than what they were anticipating. Okay, that's what we have. We have an, have an early dismissal today. <laughs> Thanks for leading us. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. oh, Yes, and, and as Jan just reminded me, we have the, um, we have the closing. I will be happy to do that in just a second here. The memorization that the author hopes that we'll, we'll remember is uh, from Matthew 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is then vindicated by her deeds. Important. Okay, in the prayer, O God, from whom all wise come all wise deeds, open our eyes to see your kingdom at work among us and open our ears to hear your call to us help us to do wisdom's deeds of mercy and love through jesus christ amen amen, amen. praise god y'all i did <laughs> what was that really here
Yeah. Go ahead, Ethan. Did he say it? Hey, Ethan, uh, Ethan, go ahead. Praise God, y'all. Yay. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice week. You too. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice week, everyone. Have a good week. Bye, Wendy. Can, Bagley, can you hold on, please, a minute? Because I'd like to catch up with your husband for a minute, if I can. Yeah, I will, but he's out mowing, so. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll catch him later then. I'll, I'll send an email. Okay. And I just have a question. I think, is Anna on? Anna, ring it, yeah. Anna yeah. is muted, though, right now. Oh, she is. But she's getting unmuted. She's she, on it. There we go. Are you on next week? Here we go. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Were you talking and we couldn't hear you? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I wondered why we didn't hear you at all. Because so, I didn't know how to unmute. Now it came up and it said it, but I didn't know how to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. We missed I your think point. Pastor wished it on me. She said, is your computer working? And I said, fine. And with that, it went dead. Oh. <laughs> I missed this sermon and I'm so upset. I, I know. Called my I called my neighbor and he's telling me what to do as he's driving to church. It's his oh. church. So, oh. um, but I eventually got back on, but I couldn't unmute. So, anyway. Well, Pastor, Pastor, we finished a little early. You could repeat it, maybe. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have two different versions of it. You have <laughs> yesterday's version is on YouTube now, and today's version will be on YouTube by tonight. So. <laughs> there you go. So, I have to know how to get on YouTube, right? We can walk you through that, but long so Adam, short. Are you on for next week then? Well, I will, but if something goes wrong with my computer like today, I don't know what I'll do. You know, I'll, I'll figure it, it out. It's never happened before, so I don't know why it did. It just went dead. It did, you know, it, I was not touching it. It just died. So. Subscribe to her page, her YouTube page. <laughs> What? And and all kinds of weird I'll, stuff. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, Anna. Why don't you prepare it? And sometimes there have been occasions where I haven't been prepared when I come to Sunday school on a Sunday morning in my class, and I say we wing it. So I'll bring the books with me, and okay. if something drastic happens, I'll wing it. How's that? That sounds wonderful. Okay. But I'm okay. counting on you doing it. <laughs> Just well, it's, my, it. it's my turn, so okay. I, I, I will do it if if my computer works. Okay, but I'll bring my stuff, and if I'll be there in an emergency. Sounds good. Okay. Just, just a reminder: the week after that, the 12th of July, is the combined service with Zion E R. Oh, right. um, so I do not think that we're going to be able to do um, Sunday school Sunday school that day. Because their service is at ten thirty. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Just so I know, do we have anything? Be do, we don't have our own service prior to that. That's the only service that day. It's the only service. Uh, when I was over to church this week, it did not work particularly well for me to live stream from outside or from my phone. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do Zoom at all that day. Okay. Um, but okay. We That's still have fine. another week and a half. Maybe something else will change. But at this point, I'm not sure how to do that. So what do we do? Just drive? It's going to be from the car? It's a drive-in, a park at the Grove. And you can leave your windows up and listen on an FM station, on the FM transmitter. Or you can roll your windows down. And Pastor Maris House said that you can hear um, the service that way. So there'll be, <laughs> I think, just a couple people up. I, they have a stage. And there'll be a couple people kind of leading worship from the stage. People have been bringing lawn chairs and sitting outside their cars in the lawn chairs because it's pretty hot in the car. I would imagine. Okay. So it's okay then to sit in a lawn chair out of your car? Yeah, they're yeah. sitting apart from each other. It's not that they're all like clumping up together. Are there, oh. is it a mask or no? I I can't answer that question. I know there are dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so you can bring your puppy. I, I, yeah, maybe we'll see. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy, for the insight. What day is it? 
Pardon, Marianne? Okay. What day is that? It's Ju uh, July. July 12. So not next week. It's two weeks. Okay. Two weeks. weeks away. Everybody have a good 4th of July. You do. A good Independence Day. Thanks. You too. You have a special plan, Susie? No. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs>